welcome to part two of this amazing episode of The Mend. Um, the Mend is a podcast to learn about services and support for victims of survivors of crime that's sponsored by the Center for Crime Victim Services here in Vermont. My name is Anna Nasset and I am your host for this bi-monthly podcast. Um, this is part two of an incredible interview with survivor Sue Russell um, from New Zealand, um, advocate Amy Farr from the Vermont Attorney General's Office and advocate and victims rights leader Seymour from here in DC. So if you haven't listened to part one, go back and listen to part one. Um, as you know, this show was created to take a deeper look at services, organizations, and concepts for victims and survivors of crime, not just here in our state of Vermont, but throughout the country and even throughout the world. Um, so we always like to mention that some of the stuff that we talk about is Vermont specific, but it can translate really well. And I also always like to start with a trigger warning. Uh, this show, we really wanna hold a space for people to hear and listen and learn um, and take these resources back out into their community or into the work they're doing. But sometimes we have stories that are sensitive in subject matter. And so we always ask that you listen at your own discretion. So with that, I'm gonna jump right back in to where we left off. Um, I'm gonna start with a question to Sue. Um, I think is really an important one. You know, many people think that once the trial is over, the sentencing is over, whatever it might be, then victims and survivors, like their, their work with the criminal justice system is done. It's like, just move on, get on with it. Mm. And sometimes that's true, but Sue, can you share what it was like to have to deal with the, the criminal justice system throughout? everything, including parole hearings, sentencing release, and how did that, did that change over the years as you saw victims' rights changing? Um, uh, well, I did have to deal with the criminal justice system for 23 years, you know, um, in 10 years, it was, or 10, 12 years or something like that, it was oh, he might get paroled, you know, so I had to, once again, get, um, go to parole hearings and testify in front of parole hearings. I believe Rob and I did that twice during our course of time. Um, and my, yeah, my recollection is those were always hard because it's like you're going back and you're revisiting and you've got to, you've got to really put forward why you don't want to think that this person should be paroled. Um, and I certainly think that I probably was had met with Amy far because there were several times when he put in appeals. I mm -hmm. think there were 12 appeals over mm -hmm. the course of that time. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when the law changed, I found myself going, well, wait a second, they've changed this restitution law. And in my case, I was never uh, all allocated restitution because the judge felt like the mitigating factors outweighed the other factors and the defender didn't have any money. Well, pff, I wouldn't have cared if he had to pay a dollar. You know, I mean, like, it was just that point. So, um, and I was always, always, always dealing with it. It, 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 it speared me to do advocacy, but it was like, it was always there in the background of why I was doing this advocacy. Um, my first recollection of change and being able to participate in that change occurred in 1996 uh, when Vermont Senator Sweetser asked me to, and she had just introduced the first, excuse me, first Vermont Victims Rights Bill. And she invited me to the hearings. And I recall this is the first time I shared my story with legislatures. Uh, in fact, it was the first time any of the senators at that time had heard, ever heard testimony from victims and survivors. They had some victim advocates there and those victim advocates turned to me and asked me if I would like to speak. And I did, I, I gave testimony. Uh, so that was my first time and Although it was my first time, that's what I did for the next 20 years. 
I provided testimony on many bills that ultimately would pass and not only improve legislation for my case, and which is why I did it, you follow along, you, let's see what we can do. Um, but it also helped uh, those others that followed me. I recall, I recall one of my biggest moments was testifying on the victims of um, the Violence Against Women's Act in 20, 2009 in front of the US Senate Judiciary Committee led by uh, Senator Patrick Leahy. That was just oh, the highlight, you know. Um, and the last bill that I testified on when I was in Vermont was the Vermont Sex Offender Registry Bill in early 2015. Now this bill stripped away the law requiring an offender to register with the Sex Offender Registry three days after being released to registering prior to being the release date. And I think Representative uh, Maxine Grad, who spearheaded that and put it through Vermont legislation because he was being released in April and that legislation was effective prior to him, prior to that April 2015 release. So he had to register for the sex offender re release prior to that. Um, I was also the first Vermont I'm sorry, for, yeah, first Vermont victim survivor to obtain a protection order that included a large geographical area, all of the Mad River Valley. And although the offender was allowed to travel in and out and through two main roads, he was not allowed to stop, like say, get gas anywhere in the valley. Mm -hmm. And I, I, Amy brought something up to me that I had totally forgotten about. Um, during this time when we were trying to find a lawyer, I believe we were trying to find a lawyer to see what kind of uh, protection I could get. And so I, I would love, Amy, if you would sort of elaborate on that because I really, I barely remember that until you brought it up. Do you want me to do that now? Or do you go want me to do that? Go for it. <laughs> sure, go for so, it. All right, I'm gonna weave it into an answer to your the broader question. Or did you have more that you wanted to say, Sue? Okay, so oh, yeah. I think when I think about this question and I'm gonna address exactly what you said, Sue, but in the context of um, kind of working with victims and how have we done that better? When I started, you know, 20 years ago, I think there was this system that just made assumptions. And I think Anne alluded to this in the first session, like, oh, we're not gonna bother Sue because this court case is over and we don't wanna keep bringing it up. And so we made assumptions that this was gonna be intrusive for her or more traumatic for her. And then we start to learn like, no, it's actually better for Sue to make that decision. And so we should include Sue in all of these responses and let her opt out. And so I feel like that was one of the things, um, especially in these post-conviction cases because there's so many people who had these long sentences and continue to file motion after motion or petition for relief. And, you know, I think, you know, someone in Sue's position may have gone for years and just not have known any of it. And that's just not fair. And it wasn't right of us to assume that she didn't want to know that or that that would be harmful for her. And so I would like to think that that has changed. It has changed in my office anyway. <laughs> so, um, and to Sue's point, I mean, I think in some ways, Sue, like, you know, you're a dream to advocate for because you're so strong and you know exactly what you want. So when we started preparing for um, the release, you did it early and Anna, you did this too. You were really prepared and, you know, you knew how you wanted to do it and you allowed time. And, you know, so for me, it was just a matter of like helping provide that time and space. And so a lot of people, I think a lot of advocates wanted to step forward and, and um, support Sue, but so my job was easy enough because sometimes I would just be bearing witness to whatever meeting we were going to go and see what was going to be on offer. And there was this one attorney and we were sitting and we had traveled like an hour at least to go see this attorney. And we were told it was going to be great and he's great and great and great. And so Sue kind of said, this is what I want. This is what I'm thinking about. And I believe like if his first suggestion, if it wasn't his first, it was his second was, so um, have you thought about getting a gun? And I was like, what? Like, what? <laughs> like, to me, it was the most bizarre. And I had to kind of not share that. And I had to wait and see what Sue thought before I shared my kind of opinion about that. But again, um, it was this 
just kind of people thinking that they know what you might need or what might be protection for you and offering this thing that I think was not, didn't fit at all with what you were saying, Sue, in that meeting. Um, so it was an interesting process again, because Sue was so clear about what you wanted and how you wanted to move forward with your community and other people were just kind of imposing kind of what they thought. Um, and that was interesting to watch. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. So I think yeah. it's, yeah, it really is. It's like when you put the victim and the survivor at the center of the table, and I use that phrase a lot when I'm talking about the team I work with, I'm like, they put me at the table. Um, I felt like they were all holding me up. Like it just really changes the experience for us as we're trying to make these steps. And yeah, it gives us that agency again. I always come back to that. Um, and what are your thoughts with how things have shifted over the years to to allow victims to have more agency? Well, I, I, I my work the first 20 years of my life, because remember I wanted to work in prisons, that was my life goal. I spent the first 20 years of my life uh, working on corrections-based victim services. When I started in 1984, there was one program in the great state of South Carolina, one program. Um, and 20 years later, and I, I will pat myself on the back because I was focused like a laser beam, all 50 states now have programs in their Department of Corrections that, you know, people think, oh, it ends at sentencing. Well, hell no, it doesn't. And there's so many issues related to safety, related to restitution, information and notification. And, and, and same with Amy's programs. Um, people don't realize attorney general's offices are, they go through the entire appellate process with victims. Many of them now, and we have victim programs in all, I, I write all 50, I know in DC we have it, all the attorney generals have victim service programs now. So it, I think it's a world, um, a world sea of, of change, looking at the fact that from the time a crime occurs, and very often before, because a lot of victims, when, they, when they're victimized, they've already had trauma experiences. They've already had victimizations. And so it goes from that point all the way through, um, I, I used to say corrections, and then I learned about the Amy's of the world, but the whole appellate process that victims also um, get sucked into, which can be totally, totally endless. The difference now is that, um, except for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but that's next on my list, We've got programs in every single prison system and victims have post-sentencing rights. And that to me is the, the biggest difference. I remember being shocked, like when someone gets out of prison, you know, you're not told that that person's coming back. You're not told where they're going to. You have no input into conditions of supervision. I'm like, what the hell? I, I did, it was just so shocking to me. And that, I think we've made, I mean, just remarkable process between the AG's victim services and the corrections-based victim services. I'm going to say yay for us. So. Yes, yay for us. And you can pat yourself on the back all you want. Uh, <laughs> You've done the work. <laughs> I, I love that work. I, I, it got me into prisons without having to work with for people that I didn't like very much. <laughs> Going back to my warden. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to echo something that Sue said to me years ago when we were talking, or maybe you wrote it to me. But it was, you know, it was regarding like speaking out um, and telling our stories to create change. And I was just beginning that process. In fact, I don't think I'd spoken at all. And I remember Sue saying, the more people who know, the safer we are. And it really resonated with me. And I mean, I can think of that for myself. I think of that for you, like how that is important um, as we move forward. And as these people do get released and we create these plans for ourselves, there is a safety in that. And um, I know who I'm calling in eight and a half years. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so one topic I wanted to cover is that of restorative justice. And I've done several episodes on restorative justice, um, even just last week. And so I think, you know, our, our listeners know what restorative justice is, but Sue, you know, what's your views on restorative justice? And I know you've done some work within it as well. And has it helped with your healing um, and how would you like to see it used within crimes, especially violent crimes? Well, I took a job with the Vermont Victim Center for Crime Victim Services. They had a grant at this time and my role was to help the community justice centers set up 
restorative justice programs that were victim focused and victim centered. Um, I do have to say, I did listen to your restorative justice show with Lisa Ryan and I may be mistaken, but I thought I heard her say a vendor focused and victim centered. And I could have been wrong, but I kind of wrote that down in my notes and I was like, yeah. And so Anne and I were having a chat about that. Um, but um, that my work with restorative justice, including working with Howard Zier, who's known as the grandfather of restorative justice, also helped me uh, develop a way that my community could wrap around and help me. Now, this is a little different because the offender was not, uh, he wouldn't be, he never admitted to what he did. You know, he didn't take responsibility, that kind of thing. But this, these community events that I held were truly victim focused and victim centered. So the first one that I did was in 2002, when I thought the offender might be paroled, I gathered a, queue, a group of community planners and we hosted Come Unite. And this was a community event to discuss how and what my community could do to assist victims like myself who were faced with somebody being paroled, possibly back in their own community, who never ever um, took responsibility, you know, denied everything and just would not fit that uh, definition of restorative justice in any shape or any form. And I recall that event. Uh, it was the first one ever done, I think Anne might even say first one done in the country um, in 2002. But I remembered we had a lot of wooden signs, 30 of them, that we painted certain legislation that would impact this particular case. And some of them were created by fellow survivors in my community that I had no idea that were fellow survivors. And they, it gave them an opportunity to tell their own story. And this was quite powerful. We had 1600 people show up in a community that's about 16,000. So 10%, not bad. Um, and we had Back at that time, we had music and food, and many spoke up, including the legislatures like Representative Maxine Grad. So now, if I can continue, we roll forward. And so in the year leading up to the offender release, Rob and I began preparing. And first, I tried to gather that same planning group of four to six people to help us organize and plan for this second community awareness event. Um, and because I had hosted the first one in 2002, I thought, yes, we can do this. Now we actually did two community events. The first one we did was in April, 2014, when the impending release was scheduled for April, 2015. We held the second community event at uh, an outdoor venue in the Mad River Valley. And we had a five member panel representatives from a victim advocate in corrections, um, corrections themselves, um, law enforcement, sex offender registry, and they each one spoke about their role in the upcoming offender release and responded to questions. Next, the larger community group that attended broke into 10 to 12 smaller groups consisting of 10 or so people and talked about what they could do in private, uh, sorry, in, in these groups collectively. One was like um, reinitiate the neighborhood watch program. Um, if if we see this person at a grocery store that, or a gas station, you know we we do the right thing. Um, they they also put up teal ribbons everywhere. That was to show support, and and they were everywhere. There were people's mailbox in you know. Uh, in very rural places, you know, uh, it was amazing. It was just a slew of support. Then, um, so now we're fast forwarding and we're getting up to the April 2015 
time. And probably around January of 2015, Rob and I said, now what are we gonna do to counter this sort of big, huge event that's coming up? Where do we wanna be and what are we gonna do? And it was at the same time that we, that Rob had been continuously being invited by his high school friend that lived in New Zealand to come for a visit. And we thought, ah, why don't we go to New Zealand the end of March, 2015, and therefore we would be here when the offenders release. But we still want this community event to happen. And, um, and, and so we decided that the, it would be good to hold another community event closer to the date. And the community organizers decided to hold this event the night before the offenders release. Again, there was a panel of professionals, including Amy and Anne. And I'm opening it up to them so they can share their side of the story there. I love that. Um, take it away either. Um, go ahead, Anne. Um, I just kind of, I mean, we're kind of rolling several of my questions into one. So I'm just going to let you all speak how you'd like on this and reflect on what Sue just said. Well, I, I, uh, I remember going up and Sue, I actually didn't realize that you and Rob weren't going to be there. I was like, where, where are they? <laughs> so when I was traveling a lot, didn't always get the advanced package that I needed. Um, but I remember going to, I think, uh, Amy was in a high school gym. It was something that had had big bleachers. And um, I hadn't really talked to people in advance. I knew Amy was going to be there. We had the, uh, I think, chief of, chief of police and the prosecutor and someone from the Department of Corrections, um, again, on a panel. And this is like, this is the night before the dude is getting out. I, I have to tell you, I didn't feel safe. I mean, I was, I never told you that. I, I just had, when I realized that this was happening the next day. Um, and so we got there and we did a little huddle before. And I, um, I asked everyone on the panel if they could get through the entire evening without saying his name. And I remember they kind of looked at me like, well, I guess we could. And I said, no, 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 can we all commit that you will not hear his name tonight? Because tonight is about Sue and tonight is about the community that's here to support Sue. And uh, we got through a, what, an hour and a half event and not one person in the panel or in the audience said his name. And that truly is one of my proudest moments as a, as a victim advocate, because um, I, I really did want it to be about Sue. And I remember being um, overwhelmed with the number of people who turned out, the number of people who wanted to do something to be helpful. And, and that, I mean, I know that's Vermont. You guys are, everyone up there is just, they're so nice. They're almost like Canadians. They're just sweet and kind and good. But the people, they weren't just saying we want to help Sue and Rob. They were like, they were towing the line. And I remember being, I was very, very emotional, um, uh, just being grateful that, uh, that the Mad River Valley uh, had, I mean, Sue was their family at that point. And, and, and it, was, um, it was extremely, extremely powerful. I think also, and, and Amy, I'll, I'll toss it to you, but I think people in the community were frightened. I remember, mm. you know, no one felt, I mean, as Sue said, this guy never accepted responsibility, never was accountable for what he did. You know, when a dude like that gets out, you should be a little nervous, if I may say. And I remember that night, I hadn't thought, I was so focused on Sue and Rob, I hadn't thought about how, what the community felt. And they felt scared too. And, and Amy, I'll turn it over to you, because that, that was an amazing night for me. But the, the community response was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I, I credit Sue for, like, highlighting those four or six people. And I know that that was one of my jobs was to reach out to them. And again, I think what was so unique about that was that um, you didn't have to go to all of those meetings. And you could say, Amy, I want you to talk to this woman and this woman and this woman. And I would go and have that conversation with that community member. And we would pull that together. And yet you were central in those spaces, even though you weren't physically there. And that was amazing. Um, but also, I think to Anne's point, this was um, restorative justice that kept you at the center, but it also kept the community at the center. And I might be 
melding the events, but the themes that came up, like when they're talking about Neighborhood Watch, they were talking about for you and in this specific case, but they're also talking about how do we do this for each other? How do we hold each other and how do we keep each other safe, even in rural spots? Or, you know, how do we think about sexual mm -hmm. violence in our community? How do we think about the impact on all of us? I mean, these themes came up and it was really, um, mm -hmm really amazing. And as Anne said, there were a lot of people there, most of them, there were some of us from agencies, but most of them were community members. And we also had like the brilliant facilitation of Karen Bastine, who um, was kind of still is, I think, like, you know, someone who really knows her stuff around restorative justice. And so, you know, some of those conversations were hard because in these situations, you don't always have the answers and we're not gonna have the answers, but sitting in community and talking about that and wrestling with it and holding that space is part of what makes restorative justice successful. And so when I look back on it and it's helpful to have everyone else's collective memory because um, I have this overwhelming just sense of how powerful that was. And yet we didn't do have all the answers and we had to do the best that we could. Right. Um, and people really came together in a way that felt really unique and special. It was amazing. It's incredible to hear. I didn't live here yet. So, I mean, I, I moved here after Sue had moved and, um, but hearing about these events just shortly after I moved here, um, as people started to get to know me and I started to speak my own truth, everyone would say, do you know Sue Russell? Do you know Sue Russell? This is what our community did for her. And for me, moving here with my own fears and kind of fleeing my own situation, hearing what this community did for Sue Russell made me know I'd found a good home. It made me know like that someday, if I need it, they're going to show up for me too. And I got very misty eyed when you were talking about people tying the teal ribbons everywhere because I can drive these roads and I can see that and I can I can feel that in my heart um, just how significant that is um, and you know I mean we are a really small tight-knit community I mean we have villages we're not cities um, so you know when I'm talking to people about where I live I'm like oh well the village is just down the road down my dirt road and around the covered bridge and they're like where do you live um, and but I think like I so I'm just gonna throw this question out there how do you see like what happened in our community, our tight little community where we basically are Canadians half the time? How do you see that translating into other places in the country, into bigger cities, into different people groups, into everything? Um, how would you envision that translating to other places? Well, we do. I live in Washington, D.C., which is a you know, very large and um, very diverse city. Um, and I mean, who knows, I, I live in the shadow of the US Capitol that's currently under siege still, don't even get me going. <laughs> but um, I mean, I live on Capitol Hill, but I live in a neighborhood where we all know each other. And we have an ANC that puts out crime reports once a week. And when a crime happens, I mean, I usually get the call, but you know, asking around with my friends, I mean, there's always someone at the community level, the neighborhood level, to respond. I can also say in DC, uh, we have the DC Victim Assistance Network. Again, when I started with the network, there were maybe 25 members and now there's like 150 organizations that, um, that work all across the city, including um, in the marginalized part of our communities east of the river, now has a one-stop shop for victim services. And so, you know, I, I remember to um, going to, um, um, uh, Burlington, when they had opened the Community Justice Center, I think I was there for the, the kickoff, and I remember thinking, Community Justice? Now, there's a crazy idea I can wrap my head around. And I, I mean, since then, I've really been promoting that concept is, is everyone in the community has a role. I always say everyone is or knows a victim of crime. And I'm going to say that again, everyone is or knows a victim of crime. And if, if you say that to a thousand people audience, it, it's nodding and bobbing. And so it's not like crime is this remote thing that doesn't impact all of us, and it does. And I, I think I, in the Mad River Valley, I mean, I'm still so moved by every time I've gone up to Vermont where people really just care about each other. And they don't ask questions, you know? It is not, you know, they are there for the potlucks and hanging the teal ribbons and 
I mean, and 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 I want to say we have that here in DC too because we make it happen. We know it's important for us, especially in a big city, to get down to the neighborhood level and 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 take care of each other. So I took that lesson from Vermont and brought it back to Capitol Hill. So thank you, Vermont. Amazing, amazing. Um, Amy or Sue, do either of you have some thoughts on? I mean, it sounds like Ann covered that pretty well, but um, do either of you have any thoughts? All right. Um, so one question I think is really important, um, you know, I know this well, Sue knows this well, is ultimately, even with incredible community support, sometimes we have to leave our beloved communities and towns and find a new home to feel safe. Um, and countries. Something, yeah, and countries. This is something that Sue and I have really bonded over. Um, can you share how you made that decision, Sue, to leave? I remember that. Sure. Um, so we're, let's go back to April 2015. Rob and I are in New Zealand. Um, but there was a lot of media around this case. And so even in New Zealand, Rob and I kept informed on our trip. And we did, it did add some stress, uh, you know, even being over here. But it was while we were here in New Zealand visiting that we had this crazy notion. We thought, let's sell our house, everything. And just sell everything, just about everything we own and move to New Zealand. Well, we said this to my husband's friend who was kind of our base. We had traveled all over the Northern Island and the Southern Island and, and we had returned to his house and, and we were getting ready to return to Vermont. And we said, yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna." We're going to do that in five months. And I recall him saying, yeah, well, a lot of friends in my family have said that, um, but no one's ever done it. You guys are crazy. Well, uh, you know, five months later, hi, can we stay at your place for a little while while we get situated? <laughs> and um, I remember, though, I remember when we returned to Vermont that spring, the Mad River Valley was still streaming with teal ribbons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of a lot of people were asking how we were doing, and we were even met at the airport with some friends. and And um, I just remembered though that we went home, and we just didn't feel safe. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was downstairs while my husband was upstairs pacing the bedroom going you know Sue come back up here that you got the lights on I'm really worried about you I mean he we, neither of us got a lot of sleep and so we just thought and I used to think oh geez you know if I'm out in if I'm out in the somebody I used to do some landscaping if I'm out landscaping somewhere you know there's so many woods around hey I could get somebody could take a pot shot at me you know and so it just, it just didn't feel safe. I mean, even with all that support. And so, um, yeah. So moving to New Zealand was crazy. It was crazy idea. We sold and we gave up so many things. We miss our family. We miss our friends. We miss some of the material things we gave. And I have to say the first three years here were extremely difficult, really difficult. Um, finding a place to live, we moved 19 times um, just because, well, we didn't have all of our things from America, the first, I'd say 15, <laughs> but then we did get our things from, from America, but we, we weren't able to purchase property because our house in Vermont hadn't sold. And so finding jobs and getting the proper work visas to remain in New Zealand was a big, big challenge. And one of the way, things we did is we both had uh, we both had work temporary partnership work visas that would expire in two years, and we actually went to the um, MP down here. Uh, sorry, um, Ministry of Parliament. Her name is Amy Adams, and she she's been, she's been very instrumental here in the prior years, building up victims uh, programs, domestic violence, sexual assault programs, and so. I had this crazy idea. I, I I heard that she was having coffee at one of these local places. I left my place of work. I drove 20 minutes, wherever it was. And I walked in and I, there was no one else except her and her um, her assistant. 
And I sat down, I shared my story and I said, Rob and I really want to stay here. How do we do this? And she ended up writing a letter to the uh, immigration manager and they, they allowed an exception in our case that if we could meet skilled migrant worker visas, we, we would be able to get residency. And that's how we did it. We did it through, through Rob was able to meet that skilled migrant worker. And um, yeah, and uh, we don't have any regrets. We live in pay, peace. We have safety, we have security. And I don't really think of that offender very much. Uh, I, I don't think of them like, you know, oh, in, in 10 years, I'm going to have to do a parole board hearing. You know, I don't think about that anymore. I don't have to think about that. I mean, it's just, it. I believe moving to New Zealand, even though it was very, very difficult, we have just healed tremendously together. And we've found, you know, we've, we've bought property. Um, probably won't be able to retire until we're 75, but you know, <laughs> um, yeah. Amazing. You have pigs, yeah. you have chickens. Um, I think all of us have taken a virtual tour of Sue's yard and it's paradise. And I, I'm so glad that you found peace and that you don't think of him. Like that's the most important. And I also love how bold you are. Just go have coffee with this lady and be like, hey, how, how am I going to stay here? I love it. It's fierce. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to be curious from me and Anne, do you hear of a lot of victims who have made these choices like Sue and I have to relocate our whole lives? Oh, ab absolutely. And I'm, I, Amy, I don't want to speak for you, but that happens all the time. And interestingly enough now, um, we actually, in a lot of states and federally, we have relocation services and support for victims for that reason. They are um, so scared uh, because of, you know, perceived fear from trauma or actual fear because they have been threatened. And the person, and like in Sue's case, did not accept responsibility and they are some scary people. So... Um, yeah, that happens a lot. She might be the farthest away of any of the survivors I've um, uh, I've known, but it but it is quite common, and and you both understand why. You feel safe where you are now, so that's what it's all about making y'all feel, helping y'all feel safe. Yeah. Um, do you want to follow up with that, Amy, or did she cover yeah, it? Yeah. No, I just I think my experience with it when someone. Um, talks about that. It's not anything I ever recommend or suggest. I think it's got to be a, a real organic process for whoever that person is. And so if someone throws that out, I say, I know people who have done that. And, you know, and so I say that is an option and, and really because I think it's scary. And I think it's really, a, like you said, it's brave and it's bold and it's risky. And I think it's a, a big uh, decision to consider. I don't need to tell you this. Um, so that when someone suggests that to me, um, I definitely, uh, you know, listen to that and try to think about how they can make that decision in the most informed way possible. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I know for myself, people told me for years, why don't you just move? Why don't you just move? And I was like, well, why do I have to move? Um, and eventually I came to that decision on my own, which, you know, I mean, that echoes everything that we've been talking about is how we have to be at the center of this and make those decisions. And okay. yeah. Um, so as we wind down, um, all three of you have spent decades working towards better rights for victims. It's truly astounding. Thank you. Like I said earlier, and I'll echo again, like I'm here and I'm alive because of you all. And that's really very powerful to me. This is such an incredible honor. Uh, see, I knew I was gonna get teared up. This is such an incredible honor to have you all on today. Um, where do you want us to, where do you want to see us in another 30 years? Like what, mm -hmm. you know, we, you've been doing this work for 30 years. Like, where do you want to see us in another 30? And that's I'll start with, theory? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not us individually, but where do you want to see this work and this movement? Um, Sue, do you want to start? Um, you know, the National Crime Victims Office host the National Victims Rights Week. And I remember one time their motto was 
No more victim. Yeah. I like that motto. Um, it, wow, wouldn't that be super? Um, but in reality, mm, you know, that's a that's a tall, tall order. So I guess um, whatever we can do to lighten that healing journey and make it um, less painful, less time consuming. And yeah, and, and instill courage and bravery in those who have gone through this. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it, we have to acknowledge that we're, we might, we're not gonna get to a place where there's no more victims. So it's how do we continue to, to build up the people who have been harmed? Um, Anne, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I, I think we can work towards no more victims. I think um, I am seeing, and I've been fortunate to be part of, a lot of work on uh, prevention and early intervention, recognizing the ACEs in kids. I mean, recognizing, I mean, I, I, I so seldom meet a victim who, who has not also had other bad things in their lives. That is just something that is part, unfortunately, of our society. I'd like to eliminate the opportunities for those early bad things to occur. And I don't think it's 30 years. I see it happening now where communities are rising up, where we as a field are looking uh, more to support marginalized communities and victims who are traditionally marginalized, who don't trust the system, who are afraid to, to access services. I also see us becoming very specialized. We now have a national center on restitution, Sue. That's pretty cool. We have a national center that works only uh, with survivors with disabilities. Uh, so we have gotten like just very, very specialized and yet we still um, intersect and interact. And I, I see that, I think our success, continued success is doing the, the mooshing of services and support at the local, state, tribal and national levels. And um, it's not 30 years from now, I, I feel it's happening now. And Amy, I, I know it's kind of happening in Vermont. I, I keep track on you people up there that you're seeing a lot of the, those connections that are super important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Vermont is kind of sneaky. We, we lead the way in a lot of these things. So um, Amy, what would your thoughts be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think of um, just continuing to um, bring victim voices to every conversation, to every space, to make sure that um, our approaches do not ignore that experience. And on top of that, to not generalize that experience. Like for me, I think the, you know, the best place to be is when harm is defined by the victim, by the community early on, not at the, I mean, as much as I am a huge fan of impact statements, it happens at the end. And why can't we start that at the beginning and let that help drive the process rather than be kind of, oh yeah, and this. Um, those are my kind of hopes and dreams for the work that we do. I like it. Absolutely, absolutely. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Well, how that would change the process completely to do that. <clears throat> um, and also I agree with Anne, we've done several shows on prevention on here and just looking at these different ways. We have a campaign that which was just launched here in Vermont called Uplift. That's really looking at how do we create a state where there are no more victims. And it takes each one of us by really committing to that. Um, so yeah, this has been amazing. I love you all very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I always like to end with just like a little positive message. I mean, I feel like you all just did that, but just like kind of a one sentence shout out that you'd love to leave with listeners um, would be great before we wrap up today. And we'll start with Sue. Um, yeah, I'm, I'd like to see us be, I'm going to say a Kiwi saying here, I'd like us to be as happy as Larry. <laughs> um, and, you know, this work, this work that you all are doing, it's part of, it's really, really good. And you're so passionate about it. And that's what makes a big difference. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, so I yeah, really, for- really thank all of you. I thank you so much. Um, I cannot tell you how excited I was to do this today because it's just, it's not about working on that offender anymore. It's not about dealing with him. You know, it's an opportunity to, to keep doing some, to keep my voice alive in Vermont, in the Incredible. United States. Incredible, in- amazing. Yeah. It's truly incredible to get to do that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I think that, you know, we all do bring so much positivity to this work because we want to see change. And our listeners who are in this field too just bring so much positivity so that we can keep moving forward. Um, yeah, and do you want to share a little last hurrah? Well, I have so many sticky notes here. So I'll go with uh, where you stand depends on where you sit. We're talking about victim agency, victim standing, um, and if if uh, victims and survivors have a seat at the table, the communal table, things are going to be um, things are going to be much better. Love that. I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> and Amy, do you have something you'd like to share? Sure. I think I've found myself, especially in the last few months, um, on the phone, usually talking to people, saying, um, you know, find your voice and ask questions and don't assume that anyone who is talking to you, um, even if they are, um, just don't assume that they know your experience. You, you know your experience and find your way to find what you need. And if it's not with that person, don't stop there. Find someone else who will hear you. And so that's, that's the theme that has been most common in the last few months in my conversations. I love that. Yes, yes. Seek out the people we need and yeah, keep our voices strong. Um, Thank you again. I could start gushing and crying once again, but I just adore each one of you. Thank you so much for everything, for being here today, for sharing, for all the work you've done. I just marvel at literally the millions of lives who have been changed because of your work. It's truly, truly inspiring. So thank you. Um, that Thanks does for it. Yes, yes. That does it for uh, this week. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, Anna at standupresources.com. I'm Anna Nassett, the host of your bi monthly podcast and show The Mend. Be well, be strong, and take care.